think you were just gonna walk in here and uh, shoot me? You, you, you thought that, didn't you? That was the plan. Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. Must be a million of them. Nope, just one. Tremors. Let's see. Oh, not much here. But then uh, I didn't expect that I'd be having aliens for lunch. Earth Girls are easy. What do these three films have in common? Each is a picture that Roger or I, or maybe both of us, is kind of embarrassed to admit we like. You've probably had that experience yourself. Maybe you like Cannonball Run 2 and never told anyone. Well, we're telling. We're devoting our entire show to 10 such guilty pleasures, some good video rental ideas from this show, we think. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. My first guilty pleasure is a movie that didn't get many good reviews, but one of them was mine. It's She-Devil, a 1989 comedy. Gene, you're going to have five chances of your own that starred Meryl Streep in a, as a flowery romance writer and Roseanne Arnold in her first movie role as an unflowery but very determined housewife. Arnold's husband, played by Ed Begley Jr., is an accountant who starts out by doing Streep's books and ends up by moving in with her. But Arnold will not concede defeat and sets about to destroy the happiness of the cheating couple. I found him! Hi, Daddy. Who let you in here, Garcia? Ruth, what the hell do you think you're doing? Andy, Nicolette, this is your new home. I'm sure you'll be very happy here. I like Meryl Streep a lot in this movie because of the way she put on a completely phony, best-selling, authorist personality and then allowed us to see the creep that lived underneath. And I like the way Roseanne Arnold just plowed straight ahead and did her best to destroy this woman who was trying to take away her husband. I don't know why so many people dislike She-Devil. Maybe all of that hostility on the screen made them uncomfortable, but if you give it a try in home video, you may find out it's better than you've heard. And I don't think you will, actually. I, uh, <laughs> I, I thought that Streep was okay. I didn't think it was anything special from her. Roseanne Arnold, I, I think, uh, wasn't given a part really to do anything fresh except have that one little note. Um, straightforward. This movie uh, is based on a series in, in Britain that is much more adventurous and much more risk-taking than this sort of standard Hollywood story uh, I, of, a, of a mano a mano between these two women and basically a lot of good things. For example, how many wrong women have ever wanted to take their kids and say, okay, you want my husband? Take the kids too. That's a good scene in this movie. Roger, there, for this kind of star power, uh -huh. there is very little that's exciting in well, this picture. Well, let's see what you think is so great. Okay. My next guilty pleasure, and it is guilty a little bit, is the horse betting fantasy, Let It Ride, with Richard Dreyfuss playing a horse player who has the one great day that all bettors dream of. He can't lose. Three to win. Let it ride. Are you sure you know what you're doing? I mean, off sound mind and all that? I'm not asking for a will. I'm asking for 48 $50 win tickets on the three horse in the seventh race. Dreyfus is, is perfectly cast with all of his manic energy. Now, I like going to the racetrack myself, and I thought that would make it tougher for me to like Let It Ride because I would sit there and find all of the technical mistakes in the picture, but that wasn't my experience at all. I thought Let It Ride was funny and dreamy, and much to my surprise, I was pretty much alone as a film critic on that score. One more point. This picture has a very fresh, unpredictable ending, and I like the courage of that, too. I'm right. The other critics are wrong. Some of the critics are wrong. You're undoubtedly right, and I'm completely in the dark. I never saw this oh, movie. I, I never that. heard of this movie. Did it open in theaters? It did, did open. It go straight Let to me video? tell you something what happened here. I think the picture, it, oh, it did open, and people that I've seen at the racetrack, they all like it, and they, uh -huh. they think it's good. So if this subject interests you, either gambling or horses or things like that, I think it might be fun. Richard Dreyfus, you would know in, in, in this Yeah, well, one. I like Richard Dreyfus. And I think yeah. this is the kind of part that but he would be built to play. But how did this movie, was this while we were on vacation and you went to the movies for fun, or what? Maybe Maybe so. I think it was a yeah, summer because release. Because it certainly sank without any trace, and that's what this show was for, to give some of these movies another chance. Will you take a chance to see it? On your word, maybe. Coming up next, Red more Hulk. guilty pleasures, including Mickey Rourke and Don Johnson in a strange partnership. Well, he's Harley Davidson, and I'm the Marlboro Man. Our special show on movies we're almost embarrassed to admit we like. Here comes a major minority opinion from me in favor of Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man, a modern-day western with Don Johnson and Mickey Rourke playing a couple of drifters who join forces to rob a bank truck to get money for the owner of their favorite bar, which is under threat of foreclosure. Think fast. Ah. Come on, get over here. Sit down. 
Guns are made to be shot, Harley, not thrown. I like their spirit together. I like the casual story. No major action scenes. And I wondered who directed this picture that way. And it turns out to be a guy named Simon Winsor, who directed Lonesome Dove, which is generally thought to be the best made-for-TV movie of all time. I know this picture was dumped on by every other critic, and sometimes when two big stars aren't in a smash hit, the picture really gets smacked around by the press. But I thought that Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man was really sweet, and I recommend it. Uh, I didn't recommend it, and you know, as you described the plot once again, I was reminded of what I thought was sort of a little hole in it. Uh, they, their favorite bar is going to be foreclosed That's on correct. by the bank, and they need how much money? Something like I don't know. Let's say hundred thousand dollars. So they're going to rob I the bank's. They're going to rob the bank's truck yeah. in order to get the money. Right. You think the bank would find it suspicious? Let's say if today their truck is robbed of a hundred thousand dollars, and tomorrow Mickey Rourke and Don Johnson come in with a hundred thousand well, dollars in cash to pay off the mortgage. They give would, it. Would that riot? Would that cause anyone to, I don't to know feel... If, I don't know if it's the same bank, but you know, <laughs> I think they have so many properties under foreclosure that they might not put it together. But the uh -huh. point is, obviously, Roger, the chemistry between these two yeah. guys. And I thought there was something there. And I do think it's a gentle hold-up picture. And I, I do credit Simon Winsor. And maybe the same thing that was going on with Roseanne and Streep. I just want to understand, mm -hmm. when you get two stars and they really don't deliver big time, Okay. Everybody is just then they get, asking. They get too extra. Much. I felt that the problem with the movie was that it was too mellow. It was too laid back. Too many whimsical little conversations that kind of meandered nowhere and not enough of an engine and I thought to drive it was the plot. Okay. My next guilty pleasure is a goofy little 1990 movie named Trimmers, which is about a group of people living out in the desert who gradually become aware that they are under attack by a group of four giant monster worms. I mean, even at the time I saw the film, I thought it was really sad to be one of only four worms, and I was never able to understand why there weren't any more of them. The worms live under the surface of the sand, and they burrow along until they find their victims. And for the local townspeople, it's hard to figure out. They don't, they don't understand that they're under attack from killer worms. Hey, wait, is this stalled out your truck? You have to be one strong son of a bitch. Thanks, too. I'll give you boys five dollars for this. Twenty. Okay, ten. Fifteen. Trimmer stars Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward among those who figure out something strange is happening, but the best scene takes place down in a basement where Reba McIntyre is the wife of a gun nut, and together they use everything in their collection, including an elephant gun, to blast one of the worms to smithereens. This is a very odd film, but in its offbeat way, it sort of grew on me and made me ask questions such as, how come there are point of view shots where we see what the worms are seeing even though the worms are blind? That's the kind of question that you I, ask. Um, I, this picture has grown on me. I gave it a negative review when it first came out. Mixed. Uh, I've seen it on uh, cable. Uh -huh. And I do watch. And I like the worms burrowing and them <laughs> jumping around on the top of the worms. So I think it is worth a second viewing. There is a, there is a spirit of good fun there. Fred Ward, a major underappreciated actor. Yes, I like is. him. Kevin yeah. Bacon has uh -huh. got a better, bigger name. Uh, it's, Don't it's you fun. always enjoy in all these science fiction monster movies where they have instruments? And they're out in the desert, and something is causing tremors, but it's not an earthquake, you know. And then they realize it's it's killer worms. I mean, I always love those discovery scenes like that. Okay, coming up, more guilty pleasures, and you'll never guess what I'm going to pick. There is no way. This is the '90s, man. Chicks got a right to choose. This guilty pleasure is a 1989 rock musical comedy named Earth Girls Are Easy which starred Gina Davis as a manicurist who is visited by three aliens who drop into her swimming pool one day in their flying saucer. Now, it takes a lot to phase a Southern California girl, and so she invites them to lunch, but they're all covered with fur, which isn't great in that climate, and so Davis's partner at the hair salon, Julie Brown, gives them a beauty makeover. Behind door number three, this is the ultimate. Girls Are Easy is not a real deep and thoughtful film. You it's sure you like, want to go on a limb on that? It's not too deep and it's not too thoughtful. Okay. It's like one of those 1950s monster movies crossed with a John Waters comedy and an art director who's really into day glow colors. But Gina Davis and Jeff Goldblum, who plays one of the aliens, have a lot of fun with the film and the movie has the courage to be exactly what it is. Silly, dumb, stupid, goofy, superficial, lightweight, and charming. Well, Roger, here's my problem. I thought that the picture was obviously just what you said it was going to be. And it's like one of those, uh, a movie that's intentionally bad to be good, like mm -hmm. the attack of the killer tomatoes. I, I thought that this picture 
uh, was so obvious in what it was trying to do to be funky and funny that it, it, that it didn't have the surprise of a truly offbeat picture. Well, I don't think it was trying to be bad. I think it was trying to be what it is, which is a good version of Earth Girls Are Easy. Okay. I, I don't think it was no. trying to be, That's you know, what, like camp or something. I, I, oh, yes. I absolutely think it was trying to be camp, and I rejected it on that basis. Okay. okay, next movie. Here's the one I was promising. Here's one that I really do feel guilty or maybe just embarrassed. And the movie I'm about to recommend a second time, we did it on our show two years ago, is Lombada. <laughs> yes, Lombada, based on the Brazilian dance craze. Maybe I'm a sucker for musicals. I was pretty much alone recently in enjoying Newsies, but Lombada, yes, Lombada. The story of, get this, a high school math teacher with a split personality. By day, he teaches rich kids. At night, he returns to his Latino roots and dances the Lombada. What's this little game you're playing with me, Sandy? I just want to have fun. Why can't we have fun together? That's J. Eddie Peck as the teacher with Melora Hardin as his dance partner. And I thought they did have some chemistry, even though the dance scenes were not well shot. And the film concludes, most improbably, not with a dance contest, but with a math contest <laughs> that the poor kids win. Let me tell you, until you've seen this, I haven't given away anything. You've got to see it to believe it. I saw it. I liked it as goofy fun. You know, as I was watching this film, I wondered whether out in Hollywood there is an executive who believes that every movie that is about Latino people has to contain one dance scene and one math contest because he saw Stand and Deliver. But I must say, when I was watching Lombada, I really expected it to end with everybody dancing. Of course. And there's this trigonometry B. I know. And then when they win it, the movie is over, and yeah. I sat there stupefied, I looking did, at the did. screen, waiting for the final dance number to come along. I sat there stupefied, but with a silly grin on my face. It was, I think, a 10 o'clock show at night. Maybe this is some kind of insight to the way critics work, but... Uh, you know, when a picture isn't screened for us, and this picture wasn't, the word on it was real bad, and you go to um, a, a screening late at night, and you're sitting there, you have no, not only do you have no expectations, you have low expectations. Yeah. And, and somehow in this kind of reverie, maybe this is why we love movies so much, that we're willing to give it a break, surrender. And then when we're not just blown out of our seats with boredom, uh, we enjoy it, and that was the spirit that I had. And I've had this a couple of times where we're pictured, and it was Marlboro Man 2, not screened for me. I go there and I say, this is not so bad. Okay, so that's a high recommendation from Mr. Siskel. He was not blown out of his seat with boredom, and he thought he would give the movie a break. I, I would really rush out and uh, run a movie on the basis of that. Yes, coming up next, a guilty pleasure <laughs> about a blind swordsman who could cut a flying melon into four pieces just by hearing it move through the air. <laughs> called Guilty Pleasures on movies we're almost embarrassed to admit we like, my next choice doesn't require too much guilt. It's Blind Fury, a solid thriller about a blind man with kung fu skills. Rutger Hauer plays the blind, mild-mannered soul who will not be trifled with. Give him the first, gringo. What's going on here? Sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, my God. Oh, that's pretty sharp. I think this film works on the that's neat level for people watching this movie, seeing him do a stunt, and then saying to a friend, that's neat. And I was all alone when I saw Blind Fury, and I still find myself saying, that's neat. <laughs> the film sets itself up for a sequel, and I do hope we get one. You know, Gene, I can take kind of pride of authorship of this film because it was written by a guy named Charles Carner, who was my student at Columbia College in film class 15 years ago. And I'm sure that even then he already had the siege of genius that is exhibited in Blind Fury. And you didn't put him out. I Listen, I like this film, too. Yeah. It is It is neat. It's kind of strange that this guy... And, of course, all you'd have to do is play a, a radio real loud, and you could completely confuse him. He wouldn't be able to hear everybody creeping up on him. But, of course, in a movie like this, they never do that. It's fun. I just picked Earth Girls Are Easy as a guilty pleasure, starring Jeff Goldblum. And now here is another Jeff Goldblum movie that got some bad reviews, but not from me. It's The Tall Guy, a 1990 British comedy, with Goldblum as the tall but usually silent half of a comedy team whose other member is short and unbearable. One day, the tall guy goes to the hospital and falls head over heels in love with a nurse, played by Emma Thompson. I mean, you know, if you'd asked me out because you thought I was pretty or nice or anything like that, it probably would have been a good idea. But um, since it's just professional inquiry, it's probably best kept short. Right. I do think you're pretty and nice as well. 
see you here at 6 tomorrow, then. Their romance is convincing and sweet, but the movie really goes over the top when Goldblum somehow gets cast as the star of a musical version of The Elephant Man. And the scenes involving the elephant musical numbers are as funny as anything along that line since springtime for Hitler and Mel Brooks as the producers. For some reason, the tall guy fell flat at the box office, but take my word for it, Rent it on video of all the movies on this show. It's the one that I like the best. Oh, gee, I, I think uh, I, I didn't like it. I, it isn't even a close call. You didn't even me. laugh during no. the Dancing Elephants. You know what? It's funny. In that sequence, and, I, and that isn't why I knocked the picture, but in that sequence, I, I saw it was an obvious attempt at a joke. I guess when it's so obvious of what they're doing, the parody. Well, you can't do but a I, musical number involving elephants no, no, that isn't Roger, obvious. No, 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 Roger. I'm just, you know what I'm saying. When, when I can tell that the joke is coming, it doesn't catch me by surprise. Uh. But I didn't have find any chemistry between Goblum and Emma Thompson. I thought that their slapstick was kind of badly done. I didn't like the picture at all. Okay, so this is Blind for the, Fury. Blind for Fury. For people is who are watching, this is the litmus test. Whether you like this movie, The Paul Man, better than Lombada. Okay, coming up next, more Send guilty. Us your postcards. You bet. Coming up next, more guilty pleasures. Two thrillers that are kind of so sick. Quiet. Establishment critics aren't supposed to like them. <laughs> Now comes my final guilty pleasure, Evil Dead 2, subtitled Dead by Dawn. Remember, Evil Dead 2, don't confuse it <laughs> with Evil Dead 1. In a horror and gore genre that consists mostly of trash, this is a movie with style and a real sense of humor. It takes place in a vacation cottage, I guess most movies do, out in the middle of the woods where you don't have to pay any extras, and the visitors accidentally invoke the presence of horrifyingly vile creatures by opening up the Book of the Dead and making the mistake of reading that incantation oh, yeah. that you're never supposed to read. The creatures attack from the woods, from the attic, from the basement, from the windows, and of course, in the dark. In one of the movie's best scenes, the hero's hand is severed from his body and it takes on a life of his own. Evil Dead 2 was directed by Sam Raimi, whose breakthrough hit was Dark Man. He's one of the best of the new breed of talented exploitation directors, and what I like is the way he uses all the usual disgusting special effects, but he makes them funny. The movie includes one hilarious point of view shot in which the Evil Dead monster, which we never see, crashes through the underbrush with relentless momentum, sweeping everything out of its way like an unstoppable juggernaut. Nothing can come between this creature and its quarry until suddenly it gets confused and stops. Well, I, I really laughed at that shot. Okay. It, was a, it was a shot that was funny. No dialogue, no characters. The shot was hilarious. Uh, I know what you're talking about in, in the exploitation genre. I think I can do better than Evil Dead 2. My last choice, and this is another rough thriller, The People Under the Stairs, directed by Wes Craven, a much more established master of the genre. A haunted house type story about a ramshackle mansion, a former funeral home, where there are, as the title suggests, voracious cannibals trapped in the basement. The house is run by an evil couple named mother and father, even though they are in reality brother and sister. So this is real sick. A nosy little kid enters the house and tries to rescue a trapped young girl. Father's one sick mother, you know that? Actually, your mother's one sick mother, too. Now, when the evil couple turns up in a brief shot wearing s and Leatherware. I thought maybe Wes Craven went too far, but before he gets to that, he once again demonstrates that he does know how to make terrifying scenes. One critic even saw this film as a commentary on the Reagan era, with the leads calling each other mommy and daddy, and they keep the working class oppressed down below. That's <laughs> clever, but the people under the stairs clearly works as a thriller, and so I'm not really that guilty in saying I enjoyed it, and you came real close in our yeah, review and last you know, year. As I think back over the film, one of the things that Craven does so well is to create the under the stairs and between the walls yes. uh, reality of that house, yes. because of course the little girl who escapes is always crawling through the tunnels, air ducts tunnels. and so forth. She kind of reminds me of the little girl in Aliens, for that matter. So these are 10 films that people can rent, and after they rent them, they'll never watch this program again, right? You've, uh, and they won't believe it. <laughs> you said that of all of your pictures that you think that the tall guy is the best? It's the most fun, yes. And Emma Thompson, who has done so much good work since then in movies like Dead Again and Howard's End, is terrific in this I movie. would say if you can handle a rough picture, an R-rated film, People Under the Stairs is the best of the group that I touted, and uh, Blind Fury, I think we both agreed on, is Blind good. Blind Fury is fun. It's a real sleeper. Don't That's forget Lombada. 
what are you going to do? As a summary, you're going to mention all five of your movies. Thank you. Terrific. I picked my favorite, and that's what I did. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with reviews of Folk, starring Tom Selleck and Donna Michi in a comedy about a desperate yuppie and his meddling father, and leaving Norma with Meg Tilly and Christine Lottie hitting the road for Alaska. Maybe one of those or one of the other pictures next week will have the potential to be a guilty pleasure. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. More than just the time of day, fashion with many faces. For work, sport, and dress, Gitano watches what watch style is. New craft free peppercorn ranch, so good it's anything but the same old grind. If it tastes too good to be fat-free, it's craft-free. Rice-A-Roni, any day of the week, the flavor can't be beat. Rice-A-Roni, the San Francisco treat. Kraft Touch of Butter Spread. It's made with rich, creamy butter. So when Kraft Touch of Butter says buttery taste, believe it. A touch of real butter makes a real difference.